We're going we're gonna to move right into our, our next plenary. And um, I think uh, Chris's speech uh, sets up this uh, next session beautifully, um, because this session is really continuing on with the, um, the discussion that uh, Chris kicked off so beautifully uh, in terms of uh, the title is Providing Solutions, What Companies Are Doing to Employ and Engage Vulnerable Youth. Um, and, and Chris has given us a great, uh, a great start to that. Uh, we have a fantastic um, panel of, uh, of experts um, also to continue the conversation. Um, you, again, in your programs have the, um, the names and the bios of everybody. But let me just give a, um, a brief introduction for you of who's on the panel, and then we'll, we'll start the discussion. Um, so to my immediate left is Martha Herrera, who is the Director of Communications and Social Responsibility of CEMEX in Mexico. Uh, Martha's had various responsibilities at CEMEX and has been working uh, 16 years with, with CEMEX. Um, and then uh, to her left is Bill Lane. Uh, Bill is the Washington Director for Caterpillar. Uh, and Bill holds a record because he's spent 37 years, I believe it is, with with Caterpillar um, to so far. <laughs> Can't hold a job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to Bill's uh, left is Patricia Devereaux, uh, who is with uh, MasterCard Worldwide. And Patricia has also been 16 years with MasterCard Worldwide um, and is their group head for corporate philanthropy and citizenship, um, was also very much involved in uh, the creation of the MasterCard Foundation, which you heard from in the morning um, from Deepali. Um, MasterCard Foundation is now independent and separate. And so Patricia heads up what the company MasterCard Worldwide uh, is doing in terms of cor corporate philanthropy and citizenship. And Patricia has also been 16 years, I believe, with MasterCard Worldwide. Wow. Um, and then finally, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, is Jane Nelson. Uh, Jane is the director of, corporate, of the Corporate Social Responsibility Initiative at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Um, Jane is also on various corporate boards, <coughs> holds uh, various other positions at Cambridge University and Brookings, and um, is a great um, uh, writer and expert in the whole field of, of corporate social initiative. Um, so we're delighted to, um, to have you all with us to uh, continue this conversation, um, and um, what, I'm, what I think we'll do is similar to the panel this morning, start out with a few questions among us, and then we really want to bring in and all of you for your, for your questions and comments. And Martha, um, why don't we start with you. Um, CEMEX is really a world leader in the field of, of cement and construction. It may be a company that, um, that some outside of Latin America are less familiar with, um, so you might want to just tell us a little bit about CEMEX, the company, but also about some of the um, key social um, uh, corporate responsibility programs you're, you're engaged in and um, how you came to this issue of youth that we're, that we're discussing here today also. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Peter, for the invitation. I'm not an expert, but I, I'll try to to communicate what we have been doing in the past years. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about CEMEX. CEMEX is a 106 years old company that grew from a local player in uh, Monterrey, Mexico, where our corporate offices are, to a, a top leader in our industry. We have participation. Uh, we, we are uh, a manufacturer and a distributor of cement, ready mix, uh, aggregates, and building materials around the world. We have uh, production facilities in 50 countries and uh, trading uh, facilities in 102 nations. We are uh, 50,000 em employees around the world, and we have a, a sales of $15.4 billion annually. Uh, we aim to, to, to help and develop the, the countries in which we participate by uh, uh, giving solutions uh, innovative solutions and sustainable solutions to the to our industry, uh, but at the same time contributing to to help um, um, in in um, in the quality of life of the people and families that works in, in in these countries. Talking about a little bit about CSR, 
we have been developing in the last 20 years some CSR programs uh, very focused on our core business. Um, we have la, the umbrella program is called Building Together because we cannot do it by ourselves. And we have different kind of programs. I'm gonna talk about three or four uh, because of, of the time. Uh, we have um, uh, been working uh, through a program called CEMEX Near You. And we have, uh, in, in Mexico, for example, we have been working with 120 communities in which we operate. Uh, we have rural communities, industrial communities, uh, semi-industrial communities, semi-rural communities. So we have a lot in, in different segments, very poor and very high end. So we, we, we have developed the, this program that is CEMEX close to you. We, we have um, what we call the community development centers in which uh, we have uh, a training for the people that live uh, nearby, or we have people that that works um, uh, that work that travel even two hours to go to the centers for training. We have in-person training and we have virtual training. We are connected to the Monterrey Tech uh, to give um, uh, all the people around uh, either uh, uh, primary, secondary, high school by virtually. But we also have training and we, we connect with uh, universities, public universities, uh, uh, private universities, uh, vocational, that are uh, nearby to provide this training for the people that lives around. We, we train around 200,000 200, people a year uh, in, the, in the different demands that we have. And we have been focusing more and more towards what the people in the cities need not only to our needs because we are not a major employer, but we have a huge value chain mm -hmm. and, um, and we also um, uh, need to, to, to promote the economic development within our cities. Um, we have also um, a program called Community Suppliers Development. We try to, to focus on, on young people, women especially, that, that wants to, to be a supplier of our company and we train them we put together uh, microfinancing companies, we put together training uh, universities, uh, NGOs to, to make this. We, uh, in Mexico right now, we have 150 small companies or co uh, cooperativas, I don't know how do you say, Cooperative. that, that, that work, works together to, to bring us um, uh, a lot of services within their company or through our value chain. Uh, we have a, a sports academy, we think that uh, focus on, on sports, uh, we have uh, f uh, soccer academies, we have baseball academies around uh, Mexico and other parts of, 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 of Latin America to, to bring uh, women that are, are training, they bring their kids, so they're, they're, they're having sports. We, we have a different program, so, so the family um, is included in the training and the, the life skills um, uh, training that we, we have. So these are different programs. I'm gonna talk about what you mentioned, the, the Patrimonio program and the self-employment centers, which are two of our uh, big big um, uh, programs that we have uh, in, in Mexico, Latin America, and some parts of, of, of Europe. Um, uh, Patrimonio OI program, it's a program uh, that w was developed 15 years ago. And um, it, it has the goal to give low-income families a complete and accessible solution for building their homes. Um, we went to live to the poorest community in Mexico for two years to <coughs> learn how a family build their homes. And after we really learned the process, um, we, we, we concluded that we needed to give them uh, financing because most of these people didn't have access to credit. Um, we have to give them uh, technical assistance, we have to give them material grants um, and technical support. So we, we bring this program with all these uh, uh, things together. Uh, we have uh, been to, uh, working together with, with youth and with women um, uh, in the last 10 years with, with this program specifically. Um, we have worked together with uh, more than a million and a half uh, people in Mexico that have built their homes, and, and not, not only their homes, but the homes of the uh, other members of the family. And uh, we have given more than $2 million in, in credits uh, until now. We want to strengthen this program. We have 85 offices in Mexico and uh, 20 offices in the rest of Latin America, but we want to strengthen this program to, to be more massive. And, but 
af uh, after learning in this program, we learned that there was a, another segment within the pyramid that cannot pay for, for this even a small credit, $17 a week credit that we give to young people or women. So we, we developed another program that is also helping young people to build their homes because they're living with their parents and this leads to other social problems. So uh, this program uh, brings a machinery to a community. Uh, young people, women, uh, uh, men can work uh, uh, with this machinery to build their own uh, uh, building materials to build their homes. And they are employed. And with that em employment, they, they can um, uh, take out 50% of the production to their own without paying. And the other 50%, they leave it to the, to the center so it can be auto, uh, sustainable. So this is a, a way we're helping. We have 40 centers mm -hmm. in Mexico. And we want to strengthen this program too because this way, young people can uh, be trained in, in the construction area. They can produce their own materials and they can build their own homes. Uh, and and after, um, besides this, they, they create different values, as you were saying, very important. They have to work together in teams, so they create teamwork. They, this uh, brings solidarity to the community. Um, they, they give support to other families that cannot uh, came by the, by the center and, and, and build their own products, so they, they build it for them. So this gives uh, and creates values to the to the communities that we participate. That's great. Thank you very much. That's, I think that's a fantastic model in so many ways of really doing your homework in the communities first, living in the communities, uh, the scale you've reached, you know, the fact that you, 10 years you're still going and you're looking to expand it. So I think it's a, a terrific model for Thank us you, all. Bill. Yeah, thanks. Um, Bill. Um, Caterpillar um, is a leader in the manufacturing world, um, and um, uh, Caterpillar Foundation has really taken a lead role recently in investing in programs for vulnerable youth, training programs for <coughs> vulnerable youth. Um, share with us a little bit of, of uh, Caterpillar's thinking in, in your investments in this area and, and, uh, and why this is an area of, of interest to Caterpillar. Uh, Peter, thanks a lot. And, uh, uh, First of all, I really want to thank you on your introduction because uh, I've, while I've been with Caterpillar for 37 years, uh, I'm also sort of their, their chief lobbyist, and that's a term no one uses in this town <laughs> anymore. And it's actually something I'm sort of proud of because representing Caterpillar has been a real honor. Um, and talk about dealing with difficult people, uh, you know, deal with Congress on a regular basis. <laughs> and that's, a, that's a whole different uh, skill set. Let, let, me, let me just uh, start generally on Caterpillar and then drill down and talk specifically on the reason why we're here today is to talk about the International Youth Foundation. Um, Caterpillar is a global concern. Um, we've always been a good company, but I have to tell you, at least in my tenure and right now, it's probably the best it's ever been for us. Uh, we've, we've increased employment. We have about 150,000 people working for Caterpillar, another 150,000 people that work for our dealerships that keep our machines operating around the world. And then there's literally millions of people that use our machines in order to, to build infrastructure, uh, mine, uh, generate power, and things of that sort. So, um, you know, we're, we're hitting on all cylinders and always with the caveat that you're only as good as your last at bat, and that can always change quickly. But, you know, so far, so good. Um, from a public policy standpoint, it's really pretty simple what we focus on. You know, we want to stay competitive. Uh, we want to open markets around the world. Uh, we want to keep the U.S. market open. We're very uh, much a free trader and against protectionism. Uh, we want to make sure the U.S. doesn't turn inward, so we're very pro-immigration. And you know, I think you always have to think of people wherever they are as an opportunity and not as a, risk, a, a threat. And the other thing that we spend a lot of time on is how do you get the rest of the world to benefit from the global economy so they can grow? And if the rest of the world is growing, uh, that means we have a very bright prospect. And uh, let me just say this. In my entire tenure at Caterpillar, we've always been a big exporter. But if you go back 35 years ago, we exported to one type of country, rich countries, oil producing countries and developed countries. Today, well over half of what we export, we're exporting to the developing world, and that's just absolutely critical. 
Now, we're here today because we really, we're, we're focusing on jobs. You know, we're focusing on jobs particularly for young people. And this is where it gets sort of counterintuitive to have business people up here to talk about jobs. Because in my entire tenure, I have never been in a business meeting where we pot, bring together the team and we say, you know what we need to do is hire more people. <laughs> Whatever we do this year, all I'm going to grade you on is how many people you hire. Now, we focus on increasing sales. We focus on reducing costs. We focus on improving quality. We focus on being safe. And we focus on having a diverse workforce. Those are all goals and things that we get graded on. Now, the amazing thing is, if you do all five of those things well, you're going to generate a ton of jobs. But if you focus on jobs, you're not going to focus on any jobs. You've got to run a first class operation. And if you do it, jobs magically appear. And then, you're, then you really do have an objective of having you know, the, the workforce in place that it's going to allow you to grow. So that's the, that's the first point. The second point is I'm on the Hill a lot. And we care about infrastructure. Infrastructure means a lot to Caterpillar. And if I try to sell infrastructure on the Hill <laughs> based on jobs, I'm going to lose. Nobody pays for infrastructure because of jobs. Because what happens is it's quickly a bridge to nowhere. And if you waste money on infrastructure, your economy is less efficient, you're more in debt, and you don't generate long-term jobs. But if you focus on infrastructure projects that improve the efficiency of your economy, better ports, better roads, things that make sense, you're Certainly, there's short-term jobs, but the main thing is you're more efficient and there's more long-term jobs. There's more investment coming into your country. And that's how you generate jobs. Now, Caterpillar has been playing a big role in an international youth foundation initiative to promote, you know, we, we've all read the book From Good to Great. Well, this has nothing to do with good to great. This is from unemployable to employable. How do you get the basic skill sets where you could get that first job. How do you make that plunger work in the bathroom? Uh, we've all had sort of similar type jobs. And you know, it's not making the plunger work so much, but it's making sure you show up on time. The first time you get yelled at work, you don't quit. That you have the fire in the belly to succeed, no matter how many times you fail. And I'll tell you, just about I think everyone in here, we all want people that have the skill set that allows them to succeed. But we all know that if you have the fire in the belly, you're going to succeed. And we're always trying to figure out, does that person have that fire in the belly? That's, that's what we would refer to it as. And what we're trying to do in, in 11 different countries, uh, Jordan is one of them, is uh, participate in a serious way. And for Caterpillar, I think it was $10.5 million, which is a major uh, commitment by our foundation to, uh, and we're partnering with all sorts of terrific companies, but how do we start providing that skill set so you can get that first job? Once you get the first job, then we'll take you from employable to good and from good to great. Um, you know, we never call anyone average anymore. You know, it's just always great or phenomenal or, or whatever. <laughs> but, the, uh, but, the, but the point is, I think this is a, a really point, a important point. Learning by doing is still the best job training. And by partnering with the International Youth Foundation in 11 different countries, we really think this is a step in the right direction. Now, why are we doing this? Do we want to hire people? Do we want to, uh, do our dealers need these people and what have you? And you know, I could say that's why we're doing it. But it's really not. The reason why we're doing it is if we don't start putting the folks in place where they can start participating from the global economy, um, you're never going to get that critical mass or that internal combustion that allows some of these countries to start growing. We're not doing it because we see a short-term benefit for the company. We're doing it because we see a long-term benefit for the country, and if that occurs, we're all going to benefit. Then what we have to do is we have to earn your business, and we have to make sure that our customers can succeed. And if they can succeed, we're going to succeed. That's a, that's, a, that's a long answer, but my only point is sometimes I think we've got to be true to what we're all about. 
We want to grow. We want to be successful. We all want jobs. But the way to generate those jobs is by having good policies in place, both as corporations and governments, that allow us all to succeed. And that's why we're really excited to be part of the International Youth Foundation. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Bill. And, and uh, I think you know, the fire in the belly and the values, I mean, really, we are, we are talking about the, very much the same things here. What I think is also fascinating about this panel is we've got an emphasis here on both the, um, the life skills and the skills for employment um, that Caterpillar is supporting, but we've also got to focus on entrepreneurship. And Patricia, um, MasterCard Worldwide is a leading financial services and technology company, and a lot of your work has been, I think, in the area of entrepreneurship. I think Henrietta this morning was, was talking about some examples that actually come from MasterCard Worldwide. So again, tell us uh, what's, what's been the journey of MasterCard Worldwide um, getting to the place where you are now in terms of your, your social responsibility programs. Yeah, no, it's my favorite thing to talk about, so <laughs> thanks for teeing that up. Uh, so I've been with the company for 16 years, and there's been a tremendous amount of change in 16 years. And when I look at my career at MasterCard, probably the thing that I am most proud of is actually the creation of the MasterCard Foundation. And so it's, I feel really fortunate to be here today, along with the colleague, to talk about the work that we do. Uh, so in 2006, we actually created the foundation as an independent entity. We literally funded them with stock that's had a run that's been unbelievable. So they're in a tremendous place to do an amazing amount of really good work. And they've got a tremendous commitment. And they're realizing an amazing impact. So we're really proud of that. But at the end of the day, though, it's not just about the foundation. They're an independent entity. They're on a track for success. So what about MasterCard Worldwide? So truly, by happenstance, I got this role about a year and a half or two years ago to lead corporate philanthropy for the company. And when I looked at it, I thought, well, it's a nice little you know, small program, really modest. But even if I had to stay within that footprint, there's so much more that we could do as a company. I don't know if anybody knows how small we are, but we actually have about 7,000 employees. But we operate in just about any country, every country across the globe. So obviously, then, we don't have this tremendous workforce then to take advantage of. But there's an amazing skill set within that, so those 7,000 people. And also, too, we've got technology. And that's got a tremendous power. Because it's you know if you put some money behind programming, get some uh, technology behind it, and then your employees, you know, there's a lot that you could realize. So at the time I took over this function, then, we really needed a strategy, because it was a lot of little different things. And you really can't do your philanthropy or giving strategy in a silo. You've got to take a holistic approach and look at what the company really brings to bear. So in conversations with everybody in the company, it's like, what should we fund? And it was just a natural for us around financial inclusion. So that's essentially, that's our business. Those are our customers. Those are the people, really, that you want to reach. You know, to, to provide access to financial services has a tremendous impact on poverty. I mean, it's been proven to alleviate poverty, period. But financial inclusion is huge. And so where are we going to focus? So we're actually focusing on entrepreneurship. So it's to further financial inclusion through entrepreneurship. So that's our strategy. So someone made a point earlier about you know, things really need to be localized. You have to understand what's going on in the market for a program to really take hold and really to achieve impact. So we work very closely with in-country staff to find programs and partners that are really going to achieve an impact They've got a great reputation, and they also offer, op offer opportunities for our employees to get involved, right? so we can bring everything to bear. So youth, of course, really resonates. You know, there are, if you ask anybody in terms of what's most important, kind of who they want to support as a segment or as a population, youth always comes to mind. There's so much about you know, enabling people to realize their potential. And I think that's what it comes down to. So with our programs, and we we look at three different areas within entrepreneurship. There's um, um, business and financial education, because it's that basic set of skills, you know, really to be able to function well. And it's not just business and education, but it's that whole picture. It's, you know, it's livelihood skills. It's just basic skills to succeed and to, and to function well in a society. Um, when I looked at the report from IYF about our program in India, so much of the feedback, though, of the, the students that are in that program was about financing and about um, 
kind of barriers or obstacles or challenges to accessing financing. And it can be, you know, they don't know how to talk to a banker or they've got, you know, they don't great, have a great kind of credit history or credit report. And then two, interest rates are high. So that's a barrier. So what can we do then to ease that barrier around access to capital, whether it's for youth starting out or an adult starting out or a small business and being able to scale. And we also look at uh, how do we help small businesses scale? Because you look at this one tier and that tier, it's, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the very bottom and it's not like you know, kind of higher up. It's that mid-tier. They have trouble accessing capital, but that's like where you can generate the most jobs. Yeah. So it's like we're really linked in there to provide programs and that support within those three pillars. So some of the programs we're operating in around the world, um, and again, so we're a global company. Uh, so in the UK, it's the Prince's Trust, and the focus is youth entrepreneurship. And the people that we touch in that community, it's, it's you know, they've got troubled histories. They've had any number of kind of personal and professional challenges. Some have finished, you know, perhaps high school, you know, maybe not. Some have been incarcerated. But they have this passion around really wanting to succeed and having you know, the opportunity to succeed. So that's a program we're really proud of. Um, we're also working in the entrepreneurship education space with the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, which is in high schools. So we've got a big commitment to them in the US, but we're also with them in Belgium because we've got a, a pretty big base of employees and in Belgium. And we're going to help them start up operations in Mexico. Right, so it's entrepreneurship education. It's this range of skills and education that's going to help them get started. And of course, then we're working with IYF in India. And again, earlier, you know, we talked about it's not just kind of a kind of one vertical in terms of what people need. So it's um, we're starting in Delhi. We'll move it into Mumbai. We'll see if we can scale beyond that. But it's providing skills and education to a pretty large pool of of young people and then helping them you know, firm up their ideas, kind of get started. And then the people and the, the business cases that have the most potential for success, graduating them up, you've got access into mentors, access to capital, access to technology, and then graduate up again. Because it really is about sustainability. So it's not just you're in for a one year or a two year program period, but how do you get things started and on a track so that that could keep moving? So youth for us is just something that really resonates, and I think it's probably it's it has a potential for the greatest impact, the lo greatest long-term impact. Great, well, that's fantastic. No, thank you, and and I couldn't agree with you more. I visited actually some of the projects in India of that of that tier of small businesses that really have the potential to grow, yeah. but are kind of caught between microfinance on the one side, which they're too big for, and bank finance, which they're not quite ready for, and so. Uh, meeting their needs is one of many uh, elements, I think, is a, is a critical intervention as well as, as you're saying, kind of a holistic approach to the issue. So yeah. thank you very much. Um, so Jane, we're, um, you know, in, in American uh, slang, you're batting cleanup, uh, <laughs> which I don't know if you know what that means. But Baby, uh, <laughs> okay. been here long enough. <laughs> so um, what, you know, you've got uh, such a great background, um, both uh, now on the board of Newmont Mining Company, having worked with many companies, having written about this issue, um, been a practitioner. So, you know, we'd love to kind of get your reflections on um, some of the trends you see in corporate social responsibility and particularly related to youth and how you see that evolving. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank, thanks very much, Peter. And good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful, wonderful to be here. And I think when I'm sort of thinking about the business case to get companies engaged in, in both sort of youth employment and, and youth engagement more broadly, I think it's useful to think of a business case almost at three levels. I think there's a general business case, which in today's world, I think is relevant pretty much for all large companies operating anywhere. Then I think, as Chris mentioned, there's sort of an industry sector case. And then thirdly, there's the individual sort of company case. And I'd like to say a bit about all three of those. And I think that the general case has been discussed a lot during the course of today. It's very obvious in the countries and the regions where there's a youth bulge um, in terms of social inclusion, political inclusion, economic inclusion. I think we're now realizing that the youth case is equally important in the so-called aging countries. Because in 
Europe, European countries, America, Japan, even China, if we're going to be able to generate the wealth to cover the pensions of an aging population, we're going to have to remain competitive. And the only way we're going to remain competitive is for the next generation having the skills and capabilities to, to get us there. And as Andrea said in her wonderful comments earlier, you know, Microsoft, I think she said, has 5,000 open positions which they can't match. And McKinsey did a study just in this country where I think something like two-thirds of employers said they couldn't fill um, you know, some of the open positions they had. So there's clearly a, um, you know, a, a strong case in, in, in the aging economies as well, as well as, a, um, you know, I think, a, a, a sort of a social inclusion case. And we're seeing this with the Occupy movement, um, that, that, that need in these countries as well to address it. Um, but I think there's a third general case, um, and it links to Jack Boyson's earlier question about sort of climate change and the environment and youth. And I've just spent um, a week in, in Pedro's wonderful city and um, came back from the Rio um, Plus 20 Earth Summit last night. And um, I think there's sort of three of the key things that are coming out of that. One of the most important messages is, I think, for the first time ever, a sort of a stronger consensus that we need a future vision that is about green, inclusive economic growth. And the green bit is obvious, and we need to do you know, more with less. But for the first time, I'm hearing much more conversations, both in Rio and at the recent G20, that we obviously need the economic growth to create the jobs, as you were saying, Bill. But it needs to be green, and it needs to be inclusive. Inclusive of low-income producers and consumers, inclusive of women, and inclusive of youth. And that, in the last few, um, this last week in Rio, was a very strong message. I think another very strong message was that for the first time ever in the history of a UN conference, they had the structure of nine major groups who actually provided official input to the governments of the world in debating what's going to be the final conclusion. One of those groups was business and industry, which was very vocal. And you know, thousands of business people there which, you know, for really the first time. But one of the other groups was youth. And I came back being incredibly inspired, but um, Jessica's comment oh, and your, your organization's sort of restless development, I think, was what I came away with, because there was both this incredible you know, creativity of the young people, but also a fair amount of anger in some of the, you know, the NGO forums of you know, that our governments and our companies aren't doing what we need, and we need to take, take more action. But so I think that sort of combination of factors um, is, you know, creates a general business case for, for all, particularly large companies, anywhere. I think the industry case is, um, has been described wonderfully by pretty much every speaker here, that um, you know, the, the travel and tourism industry, it's so clear that the case is in the job creation, the financial services industry, how do you make financial services more accessible, the information technology industry, how do you provide access to information technology, you know, construction, how do you, you know, create the construction jobs. So, so I think each industry can make the case, but I don't think many industry trade associations are doing a good enough job in saying this is why youth issues matter to our industry and our association. And it's maybe something you know, we can work with going forward to have more of an industry voice around youth. And then finally, the individual company case. I mean, we've had wonderful examples during the course of today. To me, I think each company has to ask three core questions. I mean, first of all, what does the youth demographic mean for our core business strategy and operations. You know, what, what are the risks and what are the opportunities that come from the demographic you know, shifts we're seeing in, in, uh, with young people where we operate? And you know, the, the risk management side, I think we've understood. But I think we're seeing more and more examples of companies saying, you know, how do we create what Michael Port is calling shared value, you know, either by producing products and services that directly serve young people. And we've had some great examples, I, I, I think, here on the, on the panel. You know, how do we get financial services directly to young people? How do we help young people directly build their own homes? Um, you know, how do we help young people have access to health? So how can we change our services and our, and our products and our business models to actually serve young people as customers? But then secondly, how do we include young people both as employees, but also, as you were saying, as entrepreneurs in our supply chains and our value chains. And again, I think most industry sectors, they think about it, the hotel industry has to get its food and its local services from somewhere. What are the local entrepreneurship 
opportunities in the local communities and can those go to young people? I mean, and pretty much you know, most industries can look at their supply chain and say, how can we help small entrepreneurs and how many of those can we make sure are women and, 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 and young people? So I think that's the first sort of fundamental question. How do we put it to the heart of the core business? But then secondly, how do we make our philanthropy and our community investment much more strategic and aligned to who we are as a company, to our core competencies, um, and, and, and to our core capabilities? And again, we've had great examples. And I think we're just at the tipping point of you know, taking corporate philanthropy and using it as social venture capital. Because as Andrea said in the earlier panel, it's not just about the money. But the money does matter. And how can we make each philanthropic dollar really go to work and leverage it as much as possible you know, by working in partnership with others? Or, or you know, MasterCard Foundation is a fabulous example that's using philanthropic money to seed entrepreneurship, which will have its own multiplier. Mm -hmm. so, so how do we use the, the money to do it? But then also, how do we use our people and their core competencies you know, as, as mentors? How do we use our products and services? And I think the potential to harness corporate philanthropy is, is amazing. We did a, a study nearly 10 years ago now. We looked at 50 companies, um, big American, European, Asian companies, and their foundation and philanthropy budgets were larger than the United Nations Development Program's budget for that year. And it was about 10 years ago, but this, the figures are still pretty much the same. And that even if the philanthropy is a small amount of the company's core business, if you add up the philanthropy of just the companies in this room, it can be very powerful. And if we can combine that with the donor funds from the UN, from USAID, from the British Department for International Development, I think you know, we can have a very big impact through social and sort of um, philanthropy programs. So it's how do we integrate this to the core business? How do we integrate this and make our philanthropy more strategic and aligned? And then the third question, and Bill pointed to this, is how do we engage in the policy dialogue? Mm -hmm. And how do we give a public voice I think two young people, four young people, and with young people. And I think big companies can do a lot to give young people a platform, and both a public platform. So you know, when you're doing a corporate event or there's a chamber of commerce meeting, get a young person on the platform to speak. And you're two of the most powerful speeches I've heard in the last 10, sort of two weeks was at the Clinton Global Initiative in New York, where a young man from Baltimore spoke. And just coming from Rio now, the closing plenary of the corporate meeting in Rio de Janeiro, next to the, the Queen of Sweden and several corporate CEOs was a young woman from New Zealand, 17 years old. There was, I don't know, 3,000 people probably in the room. She was just brilliant and really challenging. And, and so you know, you, you know, how do we give those, those public platforms? But going back to something I think Jessica and, and I think it was Beth said earlier, how do we make sure that it's not just listening to young people, but being accountable? <laughs> to young people. So giving them the, plat the platforms, but on a company by company basis, I loved Apali's example of setting up a youth think tank. And you know, lots of companies have advisory boards. Well, you know, could we also think about you know, setting up a youth advisory board or having a young person on your advisory board and you know, on a more regular basis listening to and engaging with young people around you know, the company's own, own strategy? So you know, how do we give a voice to young people? I think the voice for young people is obvious and that I think the business community can do a lot more to make the case for young people. And I you know, recognize the incredibly important role IYF has played here. I, I remember almost well, over 10 years ago now with Maria Katawi going to the World Bank for the first time. And the World Bank were like, youth? You know, what's it got? You know, and, and through Maria Katawi's leadership and IYF and Jim Wolfenson's acceptance, they had the first World Bank development report on youth. And the more and more we can now bring that down to the country level, how do we get, and again, not just the Minister of Youth, but the finance ministers. And, and who do the finance ministers speak to? They speak to the companies, the big CEOs. So how can the big CEOs and the chambers of commerce in countries talk to their finance ministers and their presidents and prime ministers and say, you know, this youth issue is really important to our future and our, our collective future? And then finally, and, and I'll finish here, how do we have a public voice with youth? So how can business and youth organizations work together 
around common issues. And just in today's Financial Times, there was an article about um, they're currently um, negotiating the Africa Growth Opportunity Act, which is really important. The Africans in the room will know, and I'm a Zimbabwean, uh, is really important to jobs in Africa. And industry is getting around this and saying to the American government, you know, we've really got to renegotiate this, and Bill's played a, a big role in that. Why can't IYF and some of the youth organizations work with the business organizations around you know, things that might not be directly linked to youth, but, but around sort of our, our economic role in the world um, to say, you know, youth and business together, you know, feels we, we need to be more engaged around job creation in Africa, in Latin America, in, in other countries. So I'll finish there, but I think there's three levels of how does it align to the core business, how can we make our philanthropy more strategic, and how can companies give a public voice to youth, you know, for youth and, and, and with youth? Great. Well, um, Jane, you've uh, <laughs> you, just carry it. You've hit a home run as the cleanup hitter. So <laughs> <laughs> I know what a home run means. <laughs> okay. No, but I think some of these things are so key. I mean, the entrepreneurship and, and employability relationship, working with companies in that way is so critical. Um, I want to go now into the whole issue of, of public-private partnerships and uh, ask another round of questions around that. Um, you'll have to tell us who that person from the young person from Baltimore was, so we can recruit yep. him to our Ty, to was, our work. I will but, certainly um, I will put you in but, touch. He was yeah. year up. Okay, so. all right, great. Um, so, um, Martha, let me um, let me turn to you again. Um, we heard about um, Neo this morning and the new initiative um, that um, that that you're part of, that Caterpillar is part of, a number of other companies also. Um, you know, just tell us a little bit. What was behind your um, decision to join NEO, and what your, what are maybe some of your expectations as we really look at this as a public-private partnership, getting to issues of scale? What are your hopes for it um, as we move forward? Sure. Um, well, uh, for Cemex, uh, there were like five main reasons. The first one that we really <coughs> think this is a very strong alliance, uh, long-term alliance that really will help consolidate that it's big scale that uh, has behind and in front the experience with, with uh, the International Youth Foundation, with the MIF, with the different uh, um, uh, multi, uh, global corporations uh, being part of, with the donors. I mean, we wanted to learn, and this was uh, a, a huge, a strong alliance to be part of. The second one is that we wanted to be closer to youth. We wanted to really listen to you to engage with them. And uh, it, we've been working with them in the, the last 15 years, but we really need to be uh, deeper and closer. Uh, in uh, Mexico, for example, we, we have uh, 7 million uh, ninis, what we call the ninis. Um, and, and this is not because they don't want to either uh, uh, study or work, because we, they don't have the opportunity to do that. And they, they have been label, labeling themselves as the hopeless generation. And, and we have these two problems, uh, or two aspects of the problem. The educational one, in, a w in which we have, uh, for example, um, uh, applications in the biggest public uh, universities in Mexico, around 110,000 uh, um, applications every year and only 10% get in. So we had a lot of, of, uh, of young people that it's uh, they're keeping behind. And on the other part, the labor problem, in which uh, we have to create a million uh, jobs every year in Mexico, and only 10% or less than 10% are created. So we have these two main problems, and, and we really want to be uh, part of that, uh, giving choices solutions and really engage. The third reason is uh, sustainability, uh, tr transcendence, innovation. I think, uh, uh, as, as we have been mentioning, if, if we want to, to be a prosperous company, we have to live in prosperous communities. We really believe that, and we are really pushing to, to be part of pro prosperous communities, and this is the, the third reason. The fourth reason is, uh, as a leader in Mexico and in other countries, we want to inspire. We want. We are very optimistic. We want to collaborate, and uh, we want to motivate young people to see behind the other part of of, of, of the of the line. Uh, we want others to believe as we believe, and we have to motivate 
uh, young, and, but we have to motivate government and we have to motivate NGOs and we have to motivate other, other companies, especially uh, small and medium-sized companies in Mexico. 99% um, of the companies are uh, small and medium-sized, so this is a, a huge um, arena for us. And, and um, as some of you were saying, we have to impact on the three principal agents um, that, that are involved in educational reforms. First of all, the, the local community, the <coughs> parents, the teachers, the, the, the directors of the schools, the, the second, the public authorities, and third, the international community. And, and we want to create this virtual circle in which uh, we, we teach um, to learn to know. We learn that they can learn to do, they can learn to live, and they can learn to be. So we want to be engaged on that. And, uh, and uh, lastly, we want to be a bridge uh, uh, within the, our communities. We want to be a, a bridge and mobilize others to, to, to become engaged in, 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 in this process and, um, and be part of, of NEO. So uh, we, we really believe in this initiative. We, we, have, uh, I, we think that in the, this is a, in the long run, in 10 years, we will be not only uh, doing what we think we're doing, but exceeding, and, and we will impact in different things. We are putting together internships, mentorship, coaching. Uh, we, we really have to create friendly spaces, work spaces, so young people can relate, uh, and uh, we, can, we, we have to work with the government to, to promote public policies. That's great, that's great. And I'm gonna have to use all of those five points as we go out and talk to other companies about joining NEO, because that's a really fantastic uh, conceptualization of it. Great, great. Um, so Bill, um, as a lobbyist, OK, so <laughs> you know well what it is dealing with governments. Um, I, I'm interested in, in you know, Caterpillar's view or is your view as you think about creating public-private partnerships. I mean, um, Jane was talking about that role of how we really work together as well as the policy advocacy role as we think about how we um, put youth on the agenda more going forward. Well, yeah, let, me, let me just expand upon because I thought the, uh, the answer was a, uh, the previous question was a good one. And I'd just like to expand it because you, know, you all you know, operate in this, in this environment. And I just want to give you two different ways you can sort of evaluate. I mean, why we're involved with NEO and why we're excited about it is we think it might work. Now, how do you know if it works or not? Now, you know, part of you, if you focus on the left side of the brain, you say we need all these different criteria and measurements, and we got to fill out a lot of reports, and we got to, you know, almost everything right now <coughs> when you're working, whether it's public-private or any type of philanthropic type ap uh, operation, you want to make sure the money's not wasted, and sometimes you end up spending more money on validating than actually doing, and you know, to me, that's always been sort of a trap, mm -hmm. because the most successful things I've ever worked on in a public policy standpoint are where people say, you know, that effort really moved the needle. People now think about this aspect of public policy a little bit differently than they did before. And in no way do they say success was passing a piece of legislation or increasing funding or reducing funding or getting somebody elected or not elected. But you've moved the, 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 the needle as far as the way things are happening. And that's what we hope happens here. Uh, the best validation that I got, I was in Russia last month uh, getting ready for the, uh, there's a piece of legislation on Russia joining the WTO and sort of getting ready for that, that effort. And Russia is one of the 11 countries that we're focusing on. And we had our, our folks uh, in, in Russia and they got a phone call, and they said they, the question was, tell us about this program. And um, the, the young lady who's sort of managing it for us in, in Moscow, I heard the conversation, and she goes, no, this is real. This, is, this isn't just sort of something you're doing to make your company look good or whatever. This is a real effort. Why, what do you think? And they're going, yeah, the chatter is, this could actually move the needle a little bit. To me, that was, that was a real validation. It wasn't just writing out a check. It wasn't just having a ceremony. It wasn't just having some, some class operations. You know, people in the community see this as something that is different, something that is different than what they've done in the past. So to, to me, that's helpful. It's hopeful. Now, 
will we follow through? You know, we'll, we'll be back. And uh, God help us if we have to fill out a bunch of reports and stuff like that. <laughs> but to me, the, to me, the, uh, the, the real validation is going to be sort of that, that chatter that only you all, you all know which programs are working and which ones aren't and which ones you're just are going through the, the, you know, the giving it lip service and ones that are really making a difference. And, and, and let me just give you an example. I, uh, Speaker Hasper put me on a, a commission that looked at foreign aid. And we went all over the world, and it was, it was actually sort of interesting. And you, it was sort of like getting a master's degree on uh, the Foreign Service and on USAID and what have you. And you know, the one brand, the one brand that I got anywhere in the world that was always positive from a US perspective was the Peace Corps. Former Corps people, people that interacted with former Peace Corps people, all, all over the world, people had a positive attitude. And you know what, in the back of your mind, you start going, there must be something to this. And then you become an advocate for it. And then there's other programs where no one ever says anything good about it. And in fact, we used to go about it and we used to say, don't tell us about your best practices. Tell us about your worst practices. And of course, no one from USAID would ever do that because they'd get criticized. So they'd come up with some World Bank program or something like that. But, the, uh, but, 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 but my, 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 point, my point is, you all are the best evaluators. And it's sort of the, 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 the street cred, the credibility that you, you hear and you know. You know the programs that are working. You sort of know the programs that might work. And you know the ones that aren't. And my hope is in a year or two or three, we're going to be in a meeting like this. And you're going to push back on me and say, you know, I was in Jordan. Or I was in Panama or in Peru. And this thing's really working. Or you're going to go, you know, you might want to check with your people again. Maybe they're not. But you know, to me, that's the validation that I'm going to be looking for. And it's really going to come from you all. That's great. Thanks. I mean, we will fill out the papers, and we will do it. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but I think you're absolutely right. And that's exactly what we aspire to also, that it really does move the me needle and, and really makes And people it, know it. And yeah. people know it, yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, so Patricia, um, one of the areas that we also do a lot of work in, and I know that MasterCard does a lot of work in, is the whole area of innovation and technology. And, to me, this is kind of, you know, there's the best practices or maybe the worst, but, but there's also the constant drive for innovation and what, what do we do and what do we need that's new. And so maybe you can share with us a little bit what MasterCard is seeing in that, in that area. So um, I, usually when people, you know, they look at MasterCard and you've got to put them in a category, it goes into financial services. But it's kind of yes, but no. And more and more, it's no. We're not that. So we're really, it's a technology company. And the thing is then, how do you get people thinking then about technology, you know, like about us as a technology company front and center? And the thing is, it's innovation, right? So it's a real focus for us is innovation. Uh, so we have core systems. Um, I don't know if anybody knows really what MasterCard is. I, you, I would hope that everybody's got at least one in their wallet. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, at the end of the day, we don't issue the cards. We don't have a relationship with you as a cardholder. We have a relationship with the bank. We don't have a relationship with the merchant. We have a relationship with their bank, right? So we sit in the middle. And so we've got rails that all of your, every time you put down your card, you know, that transaction goes across. You know, from merchant to the bank, through us, to the to the your your bank, and then they're like, yep, they're good for it. They'll approve the transaction. Kind of information and money value then gets transferred. So we sit in the middle of that. So the thing is, so those are core systems. Really, it's like that's our bread and butter, right? But it's um, there's more than that. And the thing is, is like there's also then product development. So it's not just those basics, but it's kind of like what's really going to make. Um, it's really going to drive business, so it's all about business development. And those products, like new products, new services, what's most relevant then for a market for an individual, whether it's for uh, the affluent, so it's the folks who really travel, you know, they are always pulling out their card, they're high users. Um, you know, what's going to resonate for them, so it's products and services that are really meaningful, and that's that innovation. And as somebody um, who, you know, I don't, I didn't, when I first got my first job, I did have a computer, but believe me, I wasn't very far past you, you know, so, but it's like it's been this learning curve then and kind of adapting to new technology, technology and it moves so quickly. And, you know, for us as a company, what we recognized um, was that it's like our workforce wasn't necessarily tuned into 
being on the cutting edge of innovation, really kind of like what resonates kind of across all generations to really keep us fresh. So when you looked at our workforce, we were not hiring people with any less than five or seven years experience, uh, work experience. And you know, you had to be a seasoned, experienced professional then to come into the company. Well, that's changed a great deal. Because the thing is, it's that the, the youth segment, whether it's you know, an end user consumer you know, who's kind of using a card online for whatever purchases they need, whether it's kind of iTunes or it's gaming, whatever. But, um, but in-house, then, how is this going to keep us fresh? So we've started as a company then recruiting in, well, one thing is we have internships. And we've really cranked that up. Um, I know on my own team, so we have an intern. We've got a, 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 a woman, young woman then who's moving on to her senior year at Northwestern. And like, what a great bit of energy, like all of a sudden get dropped into the midst of us. And the thing is, you forget about that, really. And the thing is, she comes in with new ideas about how to do things, right? So she's looking at it with a fresh perspective. We're also hiring in new college grads. So the thing is, is somebody who's got their bachelor's can actually come up to us and be hired. And this is something new. But what we recognize is like this is like a huge segment that we're marketing to, essentially. And the thing is, we're missing that if we don't have that in our workforce. And then also, too, we have uh, brand new MBAs coming in. So someone with a, you know, they've got a fresh MBA in their hand, and we want them on board. Because the thing is, there's so much of that that goes to product development. We need to hear that voice. We need to understand what that user is experiencing. We have inside of our walls um, what we call BRGs, or business resource groups. And essentially, there's some common thread that pulls these people together. So it could be the Latin network, it's the Asian network. Well, we have a group called the YoPros, and it's the young professionals. So it's a fairly broad definition. They're up to 10 years out of school, but still, young professionals. These are the most energetic, engaged people. And, th and what they really care about, honestly, too, is that the company does good, right, that you drive social impact. It's not about what you see on the bottom line. It's what the triple bottom line is, right? They really understand that. And what's neat about them is that, well, part of it is the energy. It's just you know, uh, infectious. You can't help but want to work with these people. Uh, but two, it's the, it's the ideas that they bring. Um, and one of the recent things that they started was actually reverse mentoring. Mm -hmm. So you've got somebody who's maybe 28, 29 years old. And the thing is, they recognize that there's a lot more young people in the company. They also recognize that somebody like me may not know how to talk to these, <laughs> to these young people and how to manage them. So it's a younger person than managing and, or mentoring an older manager. So the thing is that when that new hire comes in, that, that person fresh out of college, that their manager understands then when how to talk to them, what their priorities might be, just how do they experience things. So, and what that does essentially is having that fresh voice in the company helps us in terms of innovation, whether it's on the product side, whether it's on our workplace policies, you know, how we act as a company. It's a tremendous input that really keeps us out ahead, I think. That's fantastic, yeah. Well, I know our human resource uh, VP is here, so I'm sure she took note of the YoPro <laughs> <laughs> initiative. Um, yeah. But I, I think that driving innovation that way, really. And we see the same thing in, in IYF, too, to tell you the truth. So that's great. Um, so Jane, um, we've heard, I think, some fantastic examples of what companies are doing in so many ways from this panel, from all day long. Um, and in our Opportunity for Action report, we, we put out a lot of recommendations of what companies could do on their own, what they could do in partnership with others. Um, you know, just we wrap this up before we go to the audience for questions. Any thoughts, reflections you have um, on um, w are there other areas where you see, and you, you talked about some of this already, where companies can really make a difference, where we can engage better, mm -hmm. differently with companies as we, as we really seek to uh, drive this agenda forward and, and really move the needle on this issue? Yeah, absolutely. Before I get to that, I just want to pick up on Patricia's point about sort of reverse mentoring, because I think it's a, it's a really key point. And Andrea spoke earlier about peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. And I think in this, this, this day and age, the sort of idea that you know, the older you get, you, know, you might gain a bit of wisdom, but because things are changing so rapidly, you often don't you know, have the knowledge that you need. And so the idea that all mentoring relationships should be sort of two-way, mm -hmm. and that you know, company mentoring programs can you know, maybe support a high school kid who can then you know, support a you know, kid in a, in a school below or you know, someone who's marginalized. I think just the potential to do more on the mentoring front is, 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 is enormous. 
Um, and in terms of the, the, the broader partnerships, um, yeah, I, I, again, I think it's sort of two or three levels where these partnerships can be really effective. And the one is you know, sort of individual companies partnering with IYF or with a you know, local um, partner of IYF in Jordan or Indonesia. And a number of people have talked about the sort of multiplier effect of you know, the, the incredible power of just one company <laughs> Partnering with IYF along its sort of supply chain and value chain and through its philanthropy, I think can be enormous. And we need sort of millions more of those types of partnerships. You know, we need to get to where every company who's a member of the Chamber of Commerce in my country, Zimbabwe, or in Jordan, or in uh, Thailand, you know, has some type of you know sort of partnership through their, their their individual business. But then I do think there are opportunities again within industry sectors to have what I call pre-competitive partnerships amongst competitors. And Chris alluded to it earlier in the, in the you know, travel and tourism industry, and in that um, you know, when Doug asked him the question, you, know, you only take people from a certain level, and, and most companies, if you're looking to bring people into the workplace, do need a sort of certain level of skill. And we all recognize that there's a whole lot more that needs to be done, but no one company can do it alone. And yet, you know, the skills need for different industry sectors are often quite different. So getting, I think in the Middle East at the moment, there's this fledgling sort of construction group working together, you know, to develop skills for the construction sector. And the hotel and tourism industry is definitely working together for its sector. So I think, you know, to do more um, sort of, you know, pre-competitive, to, to make this sort of broader environment work better um, for, for employment and skills development within industries you know, has, has, has great potential. And then finally, I think there's enormous potential for sort of country level partnerships between sort of groups of companies and the government and donors and NGOs within a country. And again, IYF is probably you know, the one organization that started to build these, but, and, and they, they can be around you know, schools training programs, they can be around public policy. In South Africa, for example, there's a group called the National Business Initiative, which has worked with the South African government to actually develop the government's skills and training development policy for the entire country, saying, you know, this is what we need, this is where the gaps are, and how can we work with you, government, and then how can we bring the international sort of donors in to, to support some of that? Um, so yeah, I, I think not many countries, to my knowledge, have those types of sort of almost like public policy structures where you get you know, 10 of the top business leaders and a few government ministers and a few of the top sort of civic leaders um, you know, to come together and say, well, what is our vision for youth employment and engagement in our country? And as I said earlier, making sure that the, the Minister of Finance <laughs> is on that, not you know, um, you know, just, the, just the, the, the Minister of Youth. And so I think we are beginning to see some of those, um, you know, those, those innovations of where groups of companies are coming together at a country level or a city level with government and, and civil society. And, and I think a great opportunity for IYF and a follow-up onto your, your fantastic report is you know, what are those models of collective action <laughs> that um, you know, we could understand better. And you know, the, 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 the new initiative of economic opportunity in Latin America is a great example. But I think there are some others mm -hmm. so that you know, the team in Jordan can say, OK, well, what's happening in other countries that we can apply here? Because um, at the moment, we have a lot of case studies on individual companies partnering with individual NGOs or, or, or partners, but not enough examples of how it's happening at the industry level or at a country level. Yeah. And I think that, you know, there's, there's, there's real potential for that. Absolutely, no, and that's good. As a matter of fact, over lunch we were talking about exactly that as part of NEO in, in Mexico and in Monterrey um, and as one way of bringing a whole group of stakeholders. It has a caterpillar, has a, a big presence there. Uh, yeah. So, and yeah. exactly that model. So yeah. I think yeah. that's, that's, yeah. that's, yeah. that's, yeah. yeah. And it links a little bit to Patricia's point that often the innovation is greater. If you actually have caterpillar, you know, together with MasterCard and Semex, yeah. that, you know, yeah. you think outside the box. And then, you know, if you bring an NGO to the, the, the table as well, yeah. you probably yeah. will get more creative yeah. problem solving. Great. Uh, so let me let me open it up now. We still have a, a few more minutes. We're going to go a little bit over what it says in, in the agenda. So let me open it up to questions, and um, and we'll we'll start with a couple right here and try to get in as many. Um, try to keep your question as short as you can, just so we can try to get more uh, more comments in. I will. I have uh, three quick questions. I'm I'm Paulo, head of the Walmart Foundation in Brazil. Um, 
First question for uh, Caterpillar is, uh, is the first job really only what it takes? Because you mentioned it so provocative for you. Patricia, I would like if you could please to, to share a few of the numbers, how many entrepreneurs, how many remain alive after three, two or three years and everything. And Jane, you mentioned the philanthropic dollars, there's venture, venture capital investment, it's, which is exactly what I'm trying to do down there. This is why we're being innovative within the company. And, but that brings the conflict of uh, the no self-dealing clauses or depending on legislation. So I would like you to please go over the discussion of the B companies. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's take a couple of, remember, remember <laughs> these points. Let's take a, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> take a couple of questions. What, we, yeah. <laughs> Can you tell him from when here? I, when I simply brief that <laughs> wasn't intended, that wasn't intended to speak <laughs> more quickly and say the same amount. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Maria Veronica, there's yeah, somebody <laughs> near you. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, hi. Good afternoon. I'm Magdalena Fulton with Creative Associates, um, and I was very encouraged to to hear about the solutions and the private sector contributing especially as we focus in on the vulnerable youth. And uh, so in terms of uh, working with uh, a specific, specific at risk of vulnerable youth uh, populations, um, you know, creative works in this area and many of, of the practitioners here do as well. And um, there's a, you know, there's a certain, there's an extra sort of uh, a hurdle that those young people need to overcome in order to, to get uh, gainfully employed. And so, you know, for example, working through our Central America Regional Youth Alliance, we work with USAID in Honduras, El Salvador, um, Panama, and Guatemala to get young people who are, you know, truly at risk, truly mar marginalized, they're in crime, poverty, uh, gang prevention. We heard Fernando from IDB speak about the, the tremendous stigma that these young people face um, when they get into a program that we work together with, um, when they take the, the, the courage to get themselves on the right path when they've made a mistake, and when they get the right training, and then they go to, uh, to get a job, and then the, the stigma in the past sort of hits them because you know, they're, they're carried that, you know, I, I've, you know, I've committed a, you know, a petty crime, or, you know, or I, I've been in a gang and now I'm out, but I want a chance you know, at a real opportunity. So, my question to you, uh, the private sector, is you hold this tremendous power because you're not only donors, but you are employers of this future youth. What can you do um, as a community, given the NEO Alliance, given um, you know, the, the call to action that IYF is uh, providing to the conference to ease the entry of, uh, of truly most at-risk young people into the job market? Thanks. Right. OK, thanks. Um, let's see, is there there's another question over, over here? Uh, Catherine, thanks. And then we'll take uh, Maria Veronica. There's one more over here. Uh, okay, go ahead. Thank you very much. I wanted really to thank you uh, for the Tell head and the wheel. Are. Yeah, for the head and the wheel you have to, to solve the problem of the world. And sometimes also, uh, we as local NGOs, we are trying also to solve problem, uh, problems in our world. But what I'm seeing in Senegal uh, is that uh, uh, both local NGOs and Companies, when they want to change things positively, they contribute uh, the, uh, to the dependency and to, to poverty increase. Mm -hmm. uh, why I'm saying it, I will give two examples. One is from the northern part of Senegal. Uh, one global company wanted to help uh, local farmers uh, to, uh, to develop more crops and then offer them some technologies. Uh, because the obsolescence of pieces is programmed uh, five years, 10 years later, the, the peasants continue to buy uh, materials from this company. So it's like a way of expanding their markets. Uh, another example is also uh, with the government of Senegal. Uh, one global another one global company wanted to offer to the, global, uh, to the government of Senegal the possibility to have a local radio, a local new radio and television. So they build the, uh, the television, they put the pieces there. Five years later, the government has reimbursed uh, the investment of the company because mm -hmm. of changing the pieces of the material that was installed. So my question is uh, how, uh, instead of providing solutions, providing technologies, how can we support the emergence of locally adapted technologies? So supporting mm -hmm. populations to develop their own solutions uh, to address their own problems. Thank you. Okay, great. We'll take one more uh, over here. 
Thank you. My name is Tanya Matinge from Mozambique. And uh, I'd like to touch a little bit on what Jane said and Patricia. I think Patricia's got the point. I really believe you have. Uh, and I'll take it from Jane, where you said the business case. I think there's one more business case you've just missed, and it's exciting. The creative industry. That is a promising industry, and I'm going to talk about it from a uh, Mozambican perspective, an African perspective. We only export 1%, 1% of creative products. And that's too low for a continent that is a storyteller from its basic fundamental. Now, you cannot have a book, one of the most famous, best-sold books, Harry Potter, having been written by an English woman, and it's talking about witchcraft. We invented witchcraft. So, <laughs> and, 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 and that's the point. I think, I think, Patricia, if we can begin to look at the young stars, at the youth, as... If we can look, if we can actually put them on the share price and say they are the most valuable asset, bigger than the gas, bigger than inf bigger than anything you can imagine, because they will drive the new economy. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, so let's, Martha, do you want to um, address the vulnerable youth question? Yes. Okay, great, and we'll move on down the line here. Thanks. One, one thing that we have uh, done in the is uh, the what we call the rebuilding of the social tissue in the communities uh, that we participate. Um, we have a lot of dropouts that want to re-enter uh, either to study or, or to work. Uh, we, we have in Mexico a, a big, big, huge problem in which the job bank for the delinquency, the drug traffickers are the youth because uh, uh, these, these young people doesn't have any opportunity. So, uh, what have uh, we done? We have to, to work with universities a lot uh, in terms of uh, uh, universities helping us in, in psychological term, terms. We have worked a lot with cultural uh, entities, institutions that help us understand really what these young people want, who, how, how they are expressing what they, what they need in terms of uh, either sculpture, sculpting or, or painting or or, or, or singing or wh whatever, uh, the, they, they want to, to do it. So in terms of re rebuilding this social tissue that has been uh, 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 very torn down, we have to, to work closely with NGOs that specifically uh, knows how to work with, with youth to regain their confidence, re-enter, uh, uh, to, to, to work or to study and motivate them and, and to, to see, to have desire and dreams uh, and, and to, to begin very slowly to regain confidence in themselves. Great. Thanks. Let me just follow up on that. Uh, first of all, Walmart, uh, talk about a company that really has done a phenomenal job as far as uh, various development programs around the world. Uh, I work closely with Sarah, Sarah Thorne, one of the very best in Washington, and it's been a remarkable uh, the commitment that you all have made uh, over the last decade or so, it's, it's, it's great. As far as vulnerable youth, let me uh, uh, just say a few things. Uh, one is, I don't know anything about raising daughters, uh, but I've raised a lot of sons. And uh, they, um, uh, so I know everything there is to know about the various youthful offender programs that, uh, that, um, that exist in Fairfax County. But the, um, uh, but the, the, the one thing I, you know, we always, my wife and I always had this rule that a tired boy is a good boy. And so we'd do anything we could to keep him tired. Um, <laughs> and you know, actually, that's sort of what we get back to here. I mean, you got to keep people tired. And the best way to keep them tired is keep them working. And the <laughs> best way to keep a guy working is work hard. And uh, whether it's construction or whether it's, uh, you know, dealing with equipment or manufacturing. Uh, of course, we also found another thing. The best operators in the world are women. They're not men. You know, we used to think it was always men, and there was a time when you used to have cables and things like that, where you know physical strength was so important. But you know, now it's all done with toggles and this and that. But so there's been a real change there. But that gets back to that first job, which was your question. And uh, you know, people are going to make mistakes. Uh, I think in the construction trades and what have you, people are pretty forgiving on that first mistake. Um, you know, if it becomes a pattern, then it's a different issue. So, uh, you know, if you need any guidance on uh, raising teenagers, give me a call. But, um, <laughs> but other than that, I, I think this is all, it all is very complimentary. Great. 
Patricia. Yeah, and um, I'll pick up the question then on, uh, that you had about the number of entrepreneurs. So we're just like, a, we're just starting with our programs. And so with IYF, the program in India, I can tell you what the targets are. So it's the, the first tier is to reach 700 young people and then to graduate up 400 and then to actually graduate another 150 then to the next tier. And, but the hardest thing though, apart from this graduation rate is okay, so how many businesses were truly started? But then to look out a year, two years, five years, are they still in business? Did they kind of branch out? And then two, what about the job creation component of it? So it's the, the measurements are, are in place and actually we're refining our strategy so that it's truly results focused. So it's, you know, there's a results framework behind it. But I'm, you could check back with me in a year and three years and five years and we'll report out. But, yeah, but, it's, but the thing is though, it's all of that rigor around, okay, you're putting you know, money and people behind this. Okay, what are the expectations? What are the promises out? And it is number of businesses started. You know, it's not just number of people touched. You know, number of jobs created. Those are the important metrics for us. And uh, where's Sudhakar? Sudhakar is here somewhere. Um, there he is over there. So if you talk to Sudhakar afterwards, we've been supporting uh, CCFID in India, which is the same group, um, for what, more than five years now, and they've got a great track record. And so he could give you a lot more information on that with a Nokia supported program that started during the tsunami period of time. Jane. Great. Well, I'll answer the, the question about. Um, sort of rules around philanthropy being an obstruction. And then I'll link, try and link the Senegal and, and Mozambique uh, questions from um, our colleagues from those two countries. I think you've hit a problem that our regulations were created basically for a 20th century world, and they're not keeping up with the 21st century world. And so you know, we lived in a world where there was public financing, there was philanthropic financing, and there was commercial rate of return financing. And I think everyone in this room now knows that each of those categories still exists, but what's happening is in the middle of those, you've got USAID setting up an innovation fund, or the British Department for Development setting up a, a challenge fund. For example, you've got some corporate foundations trying to be more creative and yet being, being restricted. Um, and, I, and, and this whole field of impact investing where it's a, it's a hybrid or a blended value of getting some rate of return, but still having a very, very strong social focus. Not everything should go there, but I think you know, enough critical mass is going there that we've got to try and get the regulations to now catch up with that. And so we've got to try and make it easier for the donor, you know, the public donor agencies to work more easily with business, and they're struggling to do it, but you know, we're starting to make some progress there, as well as for the philanthropic foundations and the corporate ones to do it. And so I think the, the lessons we're learning from the private foundations in this country and in, and in Europe and, and also in parts of Asia and Africa, where you know, sort of program-related investments are becoming more acceptable, you know, I think we're going to move in that direction. But I'd throw the challenge back to you in that if the you know, 20 biggest corporate foundations in this world, got, I mean, well, this country, but also globally, got together under the Committee to Encourage Corporate Philanthropy, again, maybe with IYF, and said, you know, here are three or four regulations that could change or incentives that government could give us to make it easy for us to be more entrepreneurial in supporting you know, creative industries in Mozambique, um, you know, as well as the more traditional NGOs, we might have more chance in moving, moving the regulations forward. So, but you know, I, I think there's a recognition they need to change, but, but they're still not there. The question, I, I think you asked a really, and made a really important point in that so often there's negative unintended consequences and I remember years ago, someone from Oxfam, I was talking about how much philanthropic dollars a, a, a oil company was giving, and someone from Oxfam said to me, yeah, but that, you know, it, it could actually have much you know, more negative impact than, than positive impact if it isn't genuinely based in listening to and working with local partners. And that's where I think the local NGOs in this room have such an important role to play, because you're, you're often translating <laughs> between local communities and local you know, um, entrepreneurs and creative industries and some of the international, whether they're companies or donors or international NGOs coming in. And, and I think you're know, both acting as a translator, but also finding ways, and we all need to find ways to get much better, um, as I think Andrea said previously, of, of really listening and learning from local communities and, and the young people uh, you, particularly the most marginalized young people who we're all you know, trying to support and, and give input to, they've really got views, they've got ideas, 
and, and yeah, how do we how do we really try and listen to that? I and mean, I think we'll still have things that go wrong, but I, I think you know, there has been this tradition of just throwing money at a problem and assuming you know, with the best intentions it's going to be it's going to be good, and, and often it isn't. So being much more humble and listening far better, and really accepting. And I think you know, Chris said in his speech, every hotel is local, and basically pretty much every operation that a company or NGO does ultimately is local. And so we've got to be much more serious about what we mean by local and really, really listen to local voices. And then completely agree with the point about the creative industries and, and you know, Africa, but also Latin America. I mean, the emerging markets, yeah, and this is the era in so many ways of the emerging markets, and just recognizing that Western pop culture has its values and you know, we'll still have artists from the West, but that there's a, a whole new generation of, of, of creative thinking, art, music, filmmaking that's coming from Africa and Asia and Latin America, and a lot of it driven by young people. And the fact that one can now use social media, that you don't actually have to wait for the Sony label to discover you, but you can use new ways to innovate and create in, the, in this area, I think is an incredible potential. And, 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 you, and being more explicit about what, you know, what those opportunities are. And then, and then you know, young, and, you know, some of those young people who are coming up as amazing artists have come from very marginalized and difficult backgrounds. And I think we've had that in the past with sports stars who've been role models, and I think that's still very important. But you know, new types of artists who are young people who've, who you know, can be role models to their peers, as well as actually create economic wealth and, and, and revenue, and really tell the story of the incredible richness of diversity, <laughs> as opposed to us all having a more you know, sort of Western cultural model. And you know, so that's just part of it, but not all of it. So very important point. Great. Well, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we've, we've run out of time, so we, we can't take more questions. The good news is we have a break right now, so you'll have a chance to interact. I also want to just remind those of you who will be at the um, continuing with us tomorrow at the meeting, there's index cards and questions in your folders and uh, with questions related to the final plenary. So please take a look at those. And there's a box at the registration table where you can fill them in. And uh, please join me in, well, in thanking uh, Martha and Bill and Patricia and Jane uh, for a fabulous uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.